so in getting everything kicked off here, um, of course, I, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I mean, obviously, we're living in some unprecedented times these days, and uh, the purpose of today's webinar is really to discuss a lot of the challenges that organizations are having or uh, face in general when working remote, and really what to look out for, as well as some solutions that we can talk to a little bit that might be able to ease the burden just a little uh, as we continue to work through, um, again, a somewhat unprecedented time that we're finding ourselves in right now. Um, I will disclaimer things, as are most people right now, I am working from home. Um, I do have eight-year-old twins here at the house. Uh, I have confined myself into the basement of the home and built it up like a bunker. Uh, but I just want to uh, get a little bit of levity there, or at least uh, uh, give everybody a little bit of insight that if you do hear something in the background, um, it could very well be the two of them. But I'm going to try to keep any disruptions to a minimum, uh, if at all possible. So I appreciate everybody's understanding in advance. Um, so before we get started today, uh, just briefly, I want to introduce who I am. So my name is Chris Montgomery. I'm the Director of Sales with ThrottleNet. I've been with the organization now going on nine years this September. Um, with me, I also have AJ Rogers. She's on the line, and she's just reviewing our question and answer board for any questions that might come in. And then finally, I have George Rosenthal, our company president, uh, serving as our uh, webinar administrator today. Um, I'd also like to establish just a few guidelines to ensure we work through the material in the most timely manner possible. Um, first, if you have a question, feel free to enter it using the Q&A button down at the bottom of your screen. Um, and enter it there. Uh, in the interest of time, we're going to refrain from answering those questions until the end of the webinar. However, throughout the webinar, we may be responding back and forth to those questions. Um, you'll also notice there's a chat button as well as a raise your hand button at the bottom. However, we ask that you uh, refrain from using these buttons unless there's a specific need to do so, such as you just can't hear me or you can't see the slides. I haven't gotten any feedback thus far that folks are having a hard time hearing me or can't see the uh, presentation itself, and hopefully that stays um, steadfast. So thanks again for your cooperation in advance of that, and uh, let's go ahead and get started. So, so of course, the purpose of today's webinar, as we've already stated, is to review best practices, as well as what you should be concerned about as we transition, excuse me, to a uh, mobile workforce for the, for the foreseeable future. Um, you know, we don't know how long this is gonna be in effect, um, based on news reports and what you see day in and day out is that it's very much up in the air. So hopefully this doesn't continue for much longer, but let's just face facts. I don't think anything is going to go back to a state of normal, or at least as we defined it, anytime in the near future. And that's why some of the things we'll talk about today um, are all the more important. So um, because of that, we want to ensure that everybody understands just basic principles when working remote as well as what solutions you may or may not be able to use uh, just to be more effective in what you're doing right now. So in reviewing our agenda, we're gonna talk about how to work remotely. Uh, I think most people have come to terms with how they're doing it at least at this point in time. We'll maybe uh, enhance that understanding a little better. Uh, in addition to that, we're gonna be talking recommendations, different solutions that we've been using as an organization as well as what we've seen across the two or 300 networks that we support in and around the metropolitan area. And then from there, we're going to get into some of the security risks and what you may or may not be able to do about those risks. And then finally, we'll wrap up with how ThrottleNet can assist. So before we get started in our actual webinar today, I wanted to take a quick poll. I'm going to put this up on screen here. So how many of today's attendees feel confident that their data is secure when working remote? So I'm going to throw this up on screen for everybody to see and give everybody about 30 seconds or so to give me some answers back. Okay, so based on what I'm seeing so far, it looks like the majority of our participants today, 83%, feel that they're in pretty good shape. Their data is secure when working remote and, and everything is going well. Um, we only have about 1% of those joining us today that um, don't feel very confident that that is in fact the case. So that said, we'll go ahead and get into some of our thoughts on this. So in getting started, the overarching concerns that we had when we put this together um, is just ensuring that your remote work can be performed safely and securely to avoid your data being compromised. You know, and for those industries that are in healthcare or finance, um, we also want to make sure that they're compliant or at least understand kind of the differences. 
and um, to the best of their ability and when possible. So we're going to start there today. You know, for those that aren't aware, um, especially if you're not in these industries, and even when you work remote in general, you do have to be compliant, especially if you're subject to HIPAA compliance, FINRA, SOX, PCI regulations, any other acronym that a regulatory body could possibly throw at you. Um, if the method of remote access isn't compliant, you could potentially be exposing your data um, and business, honestly, to unnecessary risk. Now, there are some things you want to ask yourself just to put your mind at ease around how you're working currently. One of the questions is, am I working in a secure web-based environment or am I working off of a local server infrastructure that's housed in an office somewhere? Now, if you answer you work in a web-based environment, and by web-based what I mean is you actually go to a website or a portal that you log into and then you conduct your work there and then you log out when you're finished for the day. If that's the case, you are most likely in compliance. And the reason for that is that um, by partnering with a web-based provider, um, they are then responsible for ensuring that their systems meet whatever regulations um, you might be subject to. Now, on the other hand, if you're working via remote connectivity through some sort of VPN connection or remote desktop connection, um, you wanna make sure that you are accessing it through a secure connection. So again, VPN is gonna be secure, RDP, which is considered called Remote Desktop Protocol is what that stands for. Um, these are secure connections. Um, however, if for some reason you're not using some form or fashion of connection like this, um, your data may not be secure while in transit. So you need to make sure you get in place a solid VPN or Remote Desktop Protocol solution to be able to access your data while working remotely. Now, another question that you might wanna ask yourself is, um, how am I using file access and collaboration? How am I sharing files out to people? And how am I collaborating with people? Now, if you're using Office 365 or G Suite, um, you should again be in compliance as these typically are gonna meet minimum standards. However, there are those organizations or individuals within those organizations, they're gonna require a heightened level of compliance measure when using these solutions. And that may require that you upgrade your subscription. For example, Office 365 is typically broken out by these E1, E2, E3 variations. And for example, a lot of folks are using the E2 version of Office 365, but you may need to up to the E3 version in order for you to get additional feature functionality, storage, and meet additional compliance and regulatory requirements. And then really, one of the easiest things that you can do to ensure security around your data and accessing said data is to uh, activate, if an option, multi-factor authentication or what's known as MFA. Um, this is one of the simplest yet most effective ways to ensure security around your data. Uh, for those that may not be familiar with this, it's very similar to back in the day. You had one of these little keychains, I think they were called RFAs, if I remember right. Um, that had a six digit number that just rotated and scrolled every minute or two minutes. Um, MFA is the same thing. Essentially what happens is you log into your solution or you log into your desktop, whatever the case might be. And in so doing, you key in your username and password, and then you have to go to this secondary location, typically a cell phone, in the past, of course, one of those keychain RFAs, and type in that six digit number, and then that finally gives you access to that application. So again, this is a very simple and easy way for an organization to put in place security measures um, to ensure that people are getting to the data in a secure way. Obviously, you also need to have a secure home internet connection. You know, it's pretty simple, obviously, since most people have this. You don't need a lot of bandwidth. You just need something that's reliable. Um, however, if you are the employer, you may need to think about what your connectivity in your offices look like. Um, the reason that I say that is because if you are housing your servers and infrastructure locally and now you've got a lot of people going in and accessing this data uh, via remote connections, that's going to put a pretty significant load on your, um, on your bandwidth. And as such, you may need to increase that bandwidth. Um, if nothing else, you might want to look at in the future because it takes some time to get it built out, but you might want to consider going to a fiber connection of some kind. Um, but at least at this point in time, if you do need to increase your bandwidth, um, and especially uh, if you're with Charter, you know, I'd encourage you to reach out to them directly. 
Um, and typically they can actually increase your bandwidth without actually having to do much more than just turning it up from their side. So again, our experience with Charter has been very positive. We would encourage you to check them out, but we don't necessarily have any relationship with them or anything else. We just choose to use them. And again, we've had a very good relationship uh, and experience, I should say, with their solutions. Um, keep in mind also that cloud-based apps, uh, such as Microsoft Office 365 and the Google G Suite, they do not put any additional bandwidth or strain on an employer's internet bandwidth or in a business location's bandwidth because your end users are accessing those secure platforms directly from their PC and their internet connection at home. It's not traversing your local network. Um, however, you do need to make sure that that data is secure as possible on the home network, and we're gonna get into more detail about these things later in our presentation. Either way though, your remote workforce solution um, shouldn't, or I should say your remote workforce shouldn't have to increase their connectivity. Um, in most cases, unless they live in a rural area, and chances are if they do, they're pretty limited in what options are available to them anyway. Now, now that we've established connectivity and some of the compliance solutions, and this isn't the last time we'll be talking about some of these things, we'll be delving into this a little bit more in detail as we go, um, but let's discuss just some of the different solutions that can serve for secure remote access to your PC locally at your office. Um, there are a variety of great third-party applications that exist out there that end users can download and install on their home PCs and on their computers at work. A lot of these solutions, though, will require that their computers at work stay powered on, you know, with an example that most are familiar with being something like Go to My PC. Now, ThrottleNet also offers a solution via our EverFuel remote access, which we specifically introduced for this situation. Um, previously, we did not offer this solution up until about four weeks ago. However, when this happened, um, we saw an opportunity to help our clients and introduced it rather quickly on the fly. And from what I understand and the experiences folks have had, this has been um, a, a very good thing for them in accessing their data when another alternative was not available to them. Um, other solutions might include something like NordVPN or ExpressVPN. Um, we don't necessarily endorse these. These are just solutions that are out there online. What I will tell you is that I have talked to some folks that have looked at these solutions over the past few weeks, and in some cases, they can just be downright confusing. So because of that, I would always encourage somebody to really check out our Everfuel Remote Access, or if nothing else, go to my PC, as both of those have been very reliable solutions over the years that I've been doing this. So. And once you're connected with one of these solutions, your end users will be able to work um, securely directly from their desktops at work as if they were the, sitting there directly. So again, uh, very good solutions that exist out there in the marketplace to give you some remote access in a compliant and secure way. Now another method that you can use is Windows Virtual Desktop. Um, this solution allows for a um, secure virtual Windows experience that is usable by any device, including your phones and tablets, and it lets your users securely access their work data and applications um, from anywhere, even on an unsecured device, uh, as such as the end user's home PC. Now that's another thing we're gonna talk about here shortly is things to be thinking about as it relates to your end users working off of their home equipment. So stick with us throughout the webinar today and we'll give you some insight on what you need to be thinking about there. Now keep in mind, and this is one of the uh, more frustrating or uh, aspects of this is that this isn't a solution you can just turn on, okay? There's a lot of migration of data and everything else that needs to happen and connectivity that needs to be put in place for it to work. Um, so it's not something you can just introduce on the fly. However, if we find ourselves in this situation long term or intermittently, as I'm hearing that, hey, look, we might be doing this social distancing and may have stay at home orders in place on again, off again, um, this is a solution you might want to consider. Um, simply because it is very secure and it's fully compliant. Um, but what I will say is, and just to be clear on it, it is not the same as accessing your Office 365 account online. That's gonna be something completely different than this. I mean, this too offers access to the same tools you might have access via your desktop, but in a Microsoft hosting environment instead. Um, it does, this allows for creation of documents and collaboration in the form of Office 365 but it won't provide you with a virtual desktop environment with all your user settings and profiles. So just to make sure we're clear on that, Windows Virtual Desktop is gonna carry over user settings, profiles, basically everything that you'd need to log into your desktop 
Whereas Office 365 is really just giving you access to your applications, such as Word, PowerPoint, Excel, as well as some of the feature functionality that Office 365 offers in general. And then finally, you can also use Citrix, or if you have Citrix in place right now, um, as this does also serve as a virtual desktop solution, they use Citrix on the back end um, to house your virtual workspace. And this too allows for, for access from virtually anywhere, anytime, and on any device. We also would recommend, if you don't have it now, thinking about getting in place a more contemporary cloud phone solution, such as Ring Central, as this allows your users to use their business phone extension, uh, uh, extension directly from their cell phone or desktop. Now, the beauty of this, honestly, has been, especially in this situation we find ourselves in now, um, this has been fantastic. My cell phone, my iPad, and my desktop are all phones for me now. So literally, when my phone rings in the house, there is no missing it. It's ringing on every device that we have that I have that application loaded on. The beauty of this solution is that I can receive and make calls as if I'm sitting in my office. So the, you, the individual calling me or that I'm calling back does not get access to my personal cell phone number. And if they call me back, they're just calling my normal extension and I'm answering on my cell phone as if I'm sitting right there at my desk. Now additionally, some of the other benefits that come with these solutions include the ability to securely and remotely communicate through chat, text, or video on a computer using an encrypted channel, in addition to allowing for conference calls, depending on the features you have chosen. So for example, today we are actually using Ring Central webinars. This was a feature we had to turn on, but now that we have it turned on, it ties directly into the solution we already had in place for our cloud phone system. So again, a lot of these solutions can be all encompassing, allowing you as an organization to do virtually any sort of presentation, communication, collaboration, et cetera. And again, we'll talk in more detail about this as we continue through our webinar today. Now, another solution we've been using for those companies that have it is Microsoft Teams. Now, we're gonna probably do in a webinar here in the next week to two weeks, hopefully this time next week, assuming everything goes well, around Office 365 and some of the features you could be using right now to be more effective in your communications. Um, but Microsoft Teams, for those that don't know, has a built-in voice over IP and video conferencing solution that works incredibly well if you don't have a phone system that's hosted. Now, however, this will be limited to your internal team members since it is not something that really allows you to redirect internal calls. So you can't do call transfers using it but it does allow you to make outbound calls, assuming the contact is in your list of contacts and they have been added to your list of speed dials. Of course, we'd also encourage you to check out getting a new webcam. Uh, the webcams that come with your device are eh, more or less adequate, I would agree, but one of the biggest challenges that I'm personally having as a sales professional is really just the ability to connect with people one-on-one -on -one without being able to actually see them or be right there. Um, so a good webcam, getting that in place is, is a real benefit, um, especially to your sales team, being able to connect with individuals still. Um, what I would recommend and encourage that you do is look to a webcam that you can mount in such a way via a tripod or otherwise, so it is facing you directly as opposed to an, an upshot. Um, those upshots really are not very appealing, I think we would all agree. And also make sure that when you're doing these types of meetings, um, that you're doing so in a room that is, has consistent lighting throughout. Um, for example, in my case, I'll do it sometimes from our library, which is in the front side of my house. And as such, the sun starts coming through and the next thing you know, the camera interprets it as kind of this black and white image where I'm very bright on one side and very dim on the other side, which speaks a lot for me personally, but that's another story in and of itself. So we'd also recommend creating a solid PowerPoint presentation for your sales team. Um, of course, as this will convert them from being just a voice over the phone into a more interactive presenter, you know, as they say, a picture is truly worth a thousand words. And just speaking for myself personally, I mean, uh, I know myself and, and George, the president of our company, we've been using this time um, to just figure out new and creative ways to be more effective in our selling and marketing approach um, going forward. So when this is all over with, whenever that day comes, um, hopefully this will lend to some good things going forward. 
And it should also go without saying that you should be investing in a pair of high quality headphones as these can greatly reduce distractions in the house, especially when you've got all these folks running around you. Um, there's nothing worse than having the kids break into a fight in the next room in the middle of a conference call um, or having UPS show up and the dogs go crazy because they've got a stranger approaching the door. So we recommend uh, the Bose QC line. That is a little bit more pricey line of headphones, but it is a very good line as most would know. But also Jabra and Plantronics have really good headphones as well. Um, also with the mouthpiece that allows to um, reduce any external noise that might be coming in. So again, we would encourage checking those out. What I will tell you is that here locally in the St. Louis metro area, these are becoming harder and harder to find because of course, when everybody realized they were working remote, there was a run on them. So hopefully they'll be getting them in stock again here soon, but speaking for myself personally, I've yet been able to get a pair. So I'm working on that as we speak. And then regarding online meetings and presentations, remember that typically the solutions you have used in the past have a limited number of participants. For example, our hosted phone system allows for us to perform um, you know, meetings, but it's limited typically under the standard package, if I recall correctly, to three or four participants. So now that you're gonna have more meetings online, you may wanna consider going out there and looking at those solutions you're using and boosting it so that you have enough licenses for all the participants you may have on a call. You need to check this well in advance of the call taking place because getting that new license in place could take a couple of days. In addition to that, you have to remember that a lot of these organizations that are providing these services are inundated right now with troubleshooting calls as well as people looking to do the same thing that I just recommended you do. So the point that I'm making here is anything that you can do online would be ideal. You're gonna get a much faster turnaround time than you would if you try to um, make a personal phone call to them to talk through what your options might be. So let's take a pause here for a second because we're gonna be talking about this here momentarily, but uh, I wanna throw another poll question up. And the question of course is, as you can see here on the screen and as I get this together is, how many, excuse me, How many folks on today's attendees are using the entire Office 365 suite of products, including Teams, OneDrive, and Office? So I'll go ahead and launch this poll. We'll see what kind of results we get back over the next 20 or 30 seconds here. And then we'll get started again. Okay, this is very helpful because this outlines why I think there is some importance in doing a webinar on what Office 365 offers and how you can leverage a little bit better. So it's one of the reasons I want to include this question here. So it looks like we got about a 50-50 blend. We have 50% of the, the respondents today that seem to be using the entire um, solution set. Now we have another 50% that are using mail only, but they would like to know a little bit more about the features that Office 365 offers. So we're gonna talk a little bit about some of those right now. But we are, as I'd said a moment ago, going to do a webinar um, outlining exactly what those are going forward. So, in moving on through our webinar today though, if you're an organization that requires a lot of collaboration, 365, we as an organization and those that we partner with are finding this is an indispensable tool. Um, they have OneDrive, SharePoint, and Teams, and all of these can provide your team with the ability to work remotely while still collaborating in real time with team members. Other solutions include um, websites like monday.com and Basecamp. These allow you to create project plans as well as to perform collaboration with designated team members. Now we've also found this to be a really great way to keep people on task and, and monitor what they're doing throughout a given day. Um, basically, if you go in and you create it, you can create your project lists and project plans. They can update them, they can key notes against them. They can say whether or not they're completed in progress or if they've been started at all yet. And this gives you again a little bit more visibility given that we're all remote right now as to how your team is performing and what they're working on. And we as an open book management company, um, we would encourage you to put in place potentially metrics to track that activity and performance. It might include number of calls, number of tasks completed, or in our case, it might be number of tickets that we resolve in a given day. 
And we'd also recommend creation of how to or how do I guides, okay? And the reason that we would recommend or encourage these, um, the reason we would encourage these is because what I'm finding out there from a lot of the organizations that I'm talking to is that the way something works locally versus the way that something works um, when you're working from home are two different things. Um, we would really recommend the creation of a how-to guide or and how do I guide. And what I mean by that, and I'll give you a very real world example of this. I had an organization or uh, individual that I was working with where she was given instructions on how to access her desktop remotely. However, the way that her IT department had presented it to them was in one of two ways. You could either access your desktop remotely and go directly to your desktop, or you could log in through a VPN connection to a virtual desktop. They were two kind of different things going on there. She thought she needed to be in both, okay? The reality was it was one or the other. She just didn't know, and she didn't know who to call, and she had very vague instructions on how this whole thing was going to work. So again, we would always encourage you for your staff and team members to assemble how-to guides, and we would also encourage you to put together who to call lists, okay? And the reason that we would ask that you do this is because with who to call lists, this simply ensures that when you do have a problem, your users know exactly who to call to address that issue. Now, that might be us as your IT services provider, call ThrottleNet if it's an issue X, Y, or Z, um, or it might be management. It really just depends on what it is. But again, we would encourage folks to put together those who to call lists and get those in place so that people know what to do, okay? You also want to be thinking about how you're going to manage your fleet of mobile devices since these are going to be used heavily. Um, the reason is that staff are more likely to have these devices stolen or to lose them when they're away from the office or from home. Now, what you want to do is you want to make sure, first of all, that the data on these devices is encrypted while at rest, which will protect that data in the event it's lost or stolen. Most modern devices do have this built in, but it may still need to be turned on and configured. So you do want to check, make sure that your mobile phone, your tablet, your laptop, desktop, all of those are set up so that when that data is not being used, it's fully encrypted so somebody cannot compromise it. Now, fortunately, most devices um, include tools that can be used to remotely lock access to the device, erase data stored on it, or retrieve a backup of this data. And you can use also a mobile device management software to set up devices with a standard configuration. You know, and due to the increased possibility that this device can be lost or stolen, whether using their own device or the organization's, you must ensure that your team understands the risks of leaving them unattended in public places or otherwise when the device is not being used and encourage your staff to keep it somewhere safe. You should also create a mobile device management policy outlining what will happen if a device is lost or stolen as well as the expectations. For example, make sure that your staff knows who to report a lost or stolen device to and encourage in a positive blame-free manner to report any losses as soon as possible. The early reporting of such losses will help minimize the risk of data theft and it also ensures that if you do it in a way that is positive and blame-free, that if staff does not fear that there's going to be action taken against them, they will be more likely to respond. Those that feel like they're going to get in big, big trouble are going to be a lot less likely to report that problem promptly. And you really want to make sure that they understand the importance of keeping the software on those devices up to date and that they know how to do that. And that includes on their mobile devices as well, especially if you're allowing for a bring your own device type policy. So if you are using a mobile device management solution already, and uh, if your organization allows for bring your own device, otherwise known as BYOD, make sure that they are backing up their photos and music and anything on there that they wanna keep. Um, since these items are what are initially wiped out in the event the device is reported stolen and it's running through a mobile device management solution. So if the user finds it later, as I've had happen more than once, uh, because it got stuck in a couch cushion, but they reported it lost, and they go to look at it, all of a sudden the entire thing has been wiped clean, and they go, wait a minute, I didn't back up all my grandkids' photos or anything else, why did you do this? Well, we did it. It's a policy. You signed off on the policy, and it clearly stated that if you lose a device, 
um, that we're gonna wipe it remotely within 24 hours to ensure the data on that device is not compromised. So again, that is why it's all the more important to A, have a policy in place, B, to ensure your users know how to push updates, and C, making sure your users are regular backing up those devices in the event it's lost or stolen, so that if it is wiped out, it's not gonna wipe out five or six years worth of pictures of the grandkids because somebody just didn't think to back any of that data up. So, USB drives are another area of concern because they contain a lot of sensitive information, and this is the way that obviously when people are working remote, people a lot of times will use this as a way to transfer data. So they're easily misplaced um, when they're inserted in your IT system. Sometimes they can introduce malware to your network environment. And they are, when they're shared openly, it becomes almost impossible to track what they contain, where they've been, who's used them. And you can reduce all this in the likelihood of infection by disabling removable media or allowing only products supplied by the organization to be used, assuming the data is encrypted while at rest on the removable media. You can also, though, ask staff to transfer files via alternative methods, such as by uh, using corporate storage, collaboration tools such as OneDrive, FTP sites, or email, rather than a USB or a thumb drive. Um, these used to be limited, I realize that, because hey, I can only send a file X size, but with FTP sites, OneDrive, you can send links to those respective files if they're too big, and in a lot of cases, they do offer more ability to send larger files these days. So again, just some ideas on other ways to share data without potentially compromising you or your network. And then we've talked about this a little bit earlier, but again, I can't illustrate the importance of having a who to call list in the event of an emergency to report problems or otherwise. Again, that might be us, that could be upper management, it could be a combination of them. But again, when you're working remote and you're somewhat disconnected, Having these lists will help to put a lot of things or a lot of minds at ease on, well, if I have a problem, who do I call? Who do I need to reach out to? And then finally, and most importantly, you know, you need an employee that can work from home. Um, I can't, we can't, we can't help you here. Um, this is a solution that we've been trying to build for years. Unfortunately, um, people are hard to build in the factory. So um, some suggestions we might have. Um, we find that people that love animals are very nice. I don't know if they work any better at home or not, but let's just go with that premise and just say, hey, if they love animals, then that's a nice trait to have. Maybe they work from home well as well. So again, wish we could help you here, but unfortunately we can't. So that gives you some ideas on general remote workforce best practices, but we're gonna take some time here now to look at some of the risks that a lot of folks are not thinking about as it relates to your remote workforce. And we've alluded to some of these throughout our presentation today, but we're gonna get a little bit more detail this afternoon on what we're talking about. So first off, brief poll question again, let me throw this up on screen here. You guys can see what it is. What percentage of your workforce is using a home PC to connect from work? So give me a minute here to find that one. Okay, so again, what percentage of your workforce right now is working from home and coming through their local PC to connect everything at work. Any ideas? Oh, sorry. Be had help if I launched the poll, wouldn't it? Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> wow, okay, okay. So it looks to me like we've really got a pretty good blend. Um, it's about, give or take, about 30, 30, 30. Um, we have about 33% that 75 to 100% of their workforce is currently working from home. Uh, less than 25% that are not remoting in um, to a home PC to connect to work or using a home PC to connect to work. And then 50 to 75% um, are actually, uh, again, using a home PC to remote in to work. So thank you so much for the feedback on that. So let's talk a little bit about that. Okay. So, you know, it should go without saying that personal computing devices are, are not the most secure devices out there. Um, the reason for that is because they don't always have up-to-date antivirus solutions. I notice that a lot of folks that are working off home PCs not only do not have an up-to-date antivirus solution, but they're using whatever just came with the computer if they've turned it on at all. Um, they may already have some malware infections on the machine they are not even aware of. 
Um, they could be configured, they are not configured properly to ensure that any data that's housed on there is encrypted while at rest. Could be lacking security updates because they're not regularly applying set updates. And in some cases, heck, for that matter, a lot of cases, the, the, the operating system might be end of life, meaning it's not getting any more security updates or patches such as Windows 7. Um, they also don't have complex passwords on them typically. I mean, in a lot of cases, these are desktops that are in a central location in the home and they are used by the entire house. And you know, that's assuming again, if they have any sort of password at all. So again, most of these just don't. And if they do, it's a very easy password to compromise, ABC123 or something to that effect. We would encourage you to ask your users that are connecting to their work PCs or network via their home PC to put in place at least a complex password that exceeds 16 characters and has a number, letter, or symbol contained within. Um, I have found over the years easy ways to do this will be movie lines, song lyrics, or positive affirmations. I mean, let's just face facts. Today is, and just these days in general, um, I think we could use all the positive affirmations we can get. I know, speak it for myself, um, every day is a little bit different depending on the mindset you happen to wake up with under the current circumstances. Now, in addition, home PCs don't typically have screen lockouts turned on unless they're set up properly, meaning if they're in a public place, even though they shouldn't be right now, and the individual leaves their PC, someone could hypothetically steal it and access the data since they could enter that password as many times as they want and it's not gonna tell them that they've locked them out, all right? So anybody who's got kids with an iPad or some other device that are trying to compromise, uh, my kids are a couple of um, young hackers right now, um, trying to figure out exactly how to get into my iPad at all times. I'm changing that password once a month because they always figure it out eventually. Um, but as a, it goes without saying though, that, um, excuse me, Having a lockout set up ensures that people can't just sit there punching away on your desktop, laptop, or otherwise until such time as they can actually compromise it. Now, in an ideal world, these PCs should be provided by the company. But let's face facts. If you have a large administrative staff, say 30 or 40 employees, the idea that you'd go out and buy 30 to 40 laptops and sit them off in a closet somewhere in the event something like this were to happen is, is really, really, really low. Um, it seems like a crazy investment to make. Although I'm sure after this is all said and done, there will be some organizations that will have to. In addition, consumer grade hardware, such as the riders, routers and firewalls are also not necessarily the most compliant and secure solutions or hardware options that are out there. Again, if you're accessing data via a secure connection or a secure environment, such as a web-based application, you should be fine. But just remember that this is a weak point in virtually everyone's home that can be exploited. We would also encourage you to ask your users to create a complex password to access their wireless network, assuming there is a password in place at all. This ensures the Wi-Fi is secure and can't be accessed by a neighbor or someone in close proximity to the home. Now in my case, I don't live that close to my neighbors here. We've got a pretty fair amount of land in between each one of the houses in my subdivision. However, I can still see all of them. Um, within probably four or five of the houses within close proximity to my home. I can also tell you which ones have secure connections and which ones do not. So again, you can do that in your own home and I'm sure you would see a laundry list of connections around your area and you can see which ones are secure and which ones aren't. Don't become one of those victims. It's a simple ask as far as your employees are concerned, just to log in and change the password of their wireless network to something that's more complex and is not as easily compromised. So another quick poll question as we continue to move through things here. This one, of course, is gonna be how many of today's participants perform training on phishing attacks? Let me get that question up in front of us here. Okay, and have any idea on how to actually identify one? We're gonna provide some high level insight on this here shortly, but I'm curious as to how many folks know what to look for and if they've had any formal training around this. Okay, all right. Looks to me like we have, let's see here, still some people keying in. So roughly two thirds of those um, have had some form of training and they understand what phishing attacks look like and according to them, at least the answer that was given, they can identify any phishing attack that comes through the door. 
There's another handful, of course, roughly about a third. Fish can't land after, can't walk on land. Um, so whether they were just kidding or joshing around, I'm not sure. But either way, um, we do always have a segment of folks that have not been through this type of training. So we'll end our poll here and we will continue to move through things. So from a fishing attack perspective, they aren't going away. <laughs> not only that going away, they're going through the roof. There has actually been a substantial increase. Last statistic that I read was 667% increase in phishing attacks since this whole thing started. And here's a statistic and kind of going off script here a little bit that really shocked us that we read about yesterday as part of a TN alert that we're gonna be putting together that you guys can check out on our website next week. Um, specifically, the number one culprit for phishing attacks are websites. Everybody thinks that it's email, but it is websites. What it's actually is brand phishing. And what these are, are websites that are designed to look like trusted websites such as Apple or Amazon, and in reality are malicious sites that were built to look that way, but that are not and could compromise your data. Second to those websites was mobile, believe it or not. People getting text messages, it's called smishing. Uh, with an MI or SM, I should say, smishing attack, where they send a text and there's a link in the text itself. And then finally coming in third was phishing attacks via email. So today we're gonna talk about spotting email scams for uh, a few minutes. But again, just so you're aware, it's not isolated to just this. It, it spans websites, it spans your, your mobile phone, um, and then of course, email itself. So. Pete, they love to exploit, cyber criminals love to exploit people during times like this. Um, the World Health Organization has actually called this an infodemic. What they mean by that, I've never heard the term before, is when you have so much information coming at you from so many different sources that you can't sort through all of it to figure out what information is true and what information is not. So that said, things you look for include emails from unknown recipients with links or attachments, requests to make wire or financial transfers, tracking numbers from UPS or FedEx, especially right now, given how people are typically going to a lot of their shopping, um, and then odd phrasing or misspellings within the email itself. You know, you also wanna check in a very easy way to figure out if this is a phishing attack or a spoof attack of some kind, is to check the sender email. Um, and make sure it's not a spoof. So a way to do that is to hover over the from address. And when you do that, it's gonna pop up a little window. You may need to click on view contact or something like that, but in so doing, it will show you the email address that's actually from, not the one that it appears to be from. So if this is a spoof email, it may come across appearing to be from chris at throttlenet.com. However, once you hover over it, it's actually from chris at cyberhackers.net. So again, that's a very easy way to figure out whether it's a spoof email or a legitimate email. And if you wanna check us out online uh, via our website at throttlenet.com, we have best practices listed out there and we can even send you a sheet that you guys can have or email it to you to share with all of your end users. Another way is that hackers are exploiting um, people these days is via charities and websites claiming to be for the public good that are actually malicious sites which download malware in your computer or steal passwords. Um, these scams, cross they run the gamut. I mean, it's not just isolated to charities. Um, we're seeing it with uh, PPE, people claiming to have a wealth of uh, personal protective equipment, and they are sending out emails asking people to buy them and getting uh, credit card information in the process. There's also scams claiming that they have a cure for the virus and you need to check us out. We're going to send you something from that. Um, or they're offering some sort of financial war, uh, reward of some kind, or they are encouraging you to donate. Um, one of the ways that you can check if you're, if you're being charitable is go out to guidestar.org. Um, I use this for research of nonprofits, but if it's not listed there at guidestar.org, then chances are, it's not a legitimate nonprofit organization. In addition, if it appears to come from the government, make sure that it's coming from a .gov domain. Um, if it's not, chances are it's not actually coming from the government. Chances are, again, it's some sort of malware. Um, and then one other that we're seeing a lot of today as far as malicious sites are concerned are coronavirus tracking sites. So for example, um, when this whole thing started, 
um, web starts started popping up all over the place that were just statistical sites outlining the number of infections, deaths, critical, uh, people in critical condition, et cetera, et cetera. Um, those sites were found in some cases to be malicious. Um, they look great. They might be giving you accurate information, but at the end of the day, they're malicious in nature. Um, I would encourage you, we would encourage you to check out John Hopkins University as they do have a reliable and secure site for tracking this information if that is something that you are interested in doing. Now, if you feel that you are the victim of phishing attacks, especially if you are working off of your home PC, excuse me, you want to run whatever antivirus solution you happen to be run, using at home, and when you run that scan, follow any directions or instructions that it provides. If you've been tricked into providing a password, you should change your password immediately on all accounts and any devices that may have been compromised. And if you're using a work device, contact your IT department, or if you're one of our clients, contact us, and we can do a quick malware scan. We can assist you in changing passwords and usernames. We can handle virtually anything that needs to be done to remediate and resolve the issue. So again, if you're a victim of a phishing attack, make sure that you take action early or off and often, especially even if you're not sure, okay? Um, a lot of times, well, something just weird happened, Chris, I'm not really sure. I always find it's better safe than sorry, okay? So as far as just some ways that ThrottleNet is helping organizations get through this time, and I've touched on this earlier, um, we are providing secure remote access via our Everfuel solution. Now, this is $9.95 per computer per month. There is a $10 initial setup fees that includes a little bit of user training, and there is no commitment associated with this. You're free to cancel at any point in time. So that said, again, this is a very secure and quick and easy solution to implement. We'll handle all the, the heavy lifting on the back end and helping you figure out how to connect. Um, remotely and once that's done it's a pretty straightforward product and solution to use. In addition, uh, for those that are our managed network clients, most of what we discussed today quite honestly is covered. For example, um, we talk about things like uh, ransomware and phishing attacks. If you're the victim of one, our solutions actually quarantine the machine that was compromised while sending us an alert but isolating it off the rest of the network to ensure that it doesn't get any worse and encrypt all of your data. Um, in addition to that, we also have um, online filtering or web filtering, meaning that if your users go out to sites or attempt to visit a site that is malicious or has been blacklisted as a malicious site, at that point it's gonna prevent that user from doing so and point them in the direction of a more safe and secure environment to find the information they're looking for. And for those that don't feel like, look, a full managed solution based on the size of my organization, I don't feel is warranted. Of course, we would encourage you to look at our remote maintenance and antivirus solution, because at very least, this is ensuring that all of your desktops, servers, and otherwise are maintained, monitored, and managed by a third-party organization, in addition to providing a robust antivirus, anti-malware, and any spyware solution that we monitor, maintain, and manage for you in real time. Of course, finally, we also offer a variety of hosting solutions via the Office 365 and Azure cloud hosting environment. And these solutions, when working in concert, allow you to work from anywhere as long as you have an internet connection. When you couple this with a hosted voice over IP phone system, such as Ring Central, and honestly, you should be good to go if anything like this ever were to happen or take place again. So, if you have any questions for us specifically, if you want to view this webinar again, or if you just want to check out what services we offer, please feel free to check us out online at throttlenet.com. For our webinars, that's going to be throttlenet.com slash webinars. Or you can give us a call at 866-829-5557. So I want to appreciate everybody's time today. I'm going to take a quick look here at our chat and see what kind of questions we may have had come in. We don't have any open questions, but it looks like we do have a couple of things coming across on chat. So we'll address those real quick here. Da, da, da. Yeah, from the looks of things, I don't see where we have any additional questions. And the one chat question that we did have come up, it looks like we have addressed and are in good shape. So again, we do appreciate everyone's time today. We thank you so much for your participation and joining us. And as I said earlier, um, we are going to be doing a webinar on Office 365, outlining a lot of the feature functionality associated with that solution over the next, hopefully by this time next Thursday. But you will be getting invites to that if you want to join us. We'd certainly welcome you to do so. 
Um, and in addition to that, we'll be pushing out a TN alert, uh, most likely midweek next week, that will also outline some of the things to be concerned about as it relates to malicious websites, smishing attacks, and general phishing attacks, and just giving you some insight as to what websites are most compromised via what they call brand phishing. So again, finally, one last time, we thank you for your time today, and we certainly do appreciate and we look forward to talking to you guys next time. We hope that you uh, have a great afternoon, and remember to wash your hands. Thank you.